to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. In Romans chapter 4, verse number 3, the Apostle Paul asked the question, What does the Scripture say? We welcome you today to our study of Bible questions and answers. In this series of lessons, we're taking questions that have been submitted by our viewers, and we're looking to the Word of God for an answer to those wonderful questions. If you'd like to submit a question, you can do that through email at questions at thegospelofchrist.com or you can visit our website, thegospelofchrist.com slash questions and fill out a form and that question will be submitted to us and we'll do our best to answer that from the Word of God. And as always, we want to encourage you to visit the Church of Christ in your area. Today's lessons are being brought to you by members of the Church of Christ and those members would love for you to stop by and visit their assembly. If you have a Bible question, maybe they could answer locally or you'd like to study further with them, they'd be more than happy to do that. Let's now direct our attention to the first question that our viewer has submitted today. And that question as we think about Bible questions and answers is this. I'm dating a man who has been married and divorced several times. Is it okay to date him? And what does the Bible say about marrying someone who is divorced? The Bible teaches all the way back to Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. God's original plan and pattern for marriage is one man and one woman entering into the union of marriage and having that family and that lasting for life. And so that's God's original plan and original pattern. But sometimes sin enters in and as a result people find themselves in situations where they may have to divorce someone for fornication and immorality. And so to answer the basic question, God's plan is one man, one woman for life. Now, what about someone who is dating a person who's been married and divorced several times? Well, friend, you sure want to be clear and you sure want to find out about that situation. Not every person who has been married and divorced is a candidate to be married again. Here's what we mean by that. Listen to the words of Jesus beginning in Matthew 19 verse number 3. The Pharisees came to Jesus, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? And Jesus answered and said to them, Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female and said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then they're no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. Well, they said to Jesus, Why then did Moses command to give a certificate of divorce and put her away? He said to them, Moses, because of the hardness of your heart, permitted you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. Now notice verse number 9. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for fornication, sexual immorality, and marries another, commits adultery. And whoever marries her who is divorced, commits adultery. What's the Lord's teaching about divorce and remarriage? Jesus said that whoever divorces his wife, for any reason, except fornication, and then goes out and marries another, or marries her who is divorced unscripturally, commits adultery. What did Jesus teach on this subject? The only scriptural reason for divorce is fornication. That Greek word fornication, pornea, means illicit sexual activity. 
unless someone has been involved in sexual activity with another, fornication, adultery, whatever word we may want to use to describe that, that's the only reason that God gives in the Bible for divorce and then and only then is the innocent party free to remarry according to Matthew 19 9 and so how do we answer today's question if you're dating someone that has been married and divorced several times friend you want to look into that your soul depends upon it your relationship with God depends upon it if that person has been divorced several times and one or any of those reasons for being divorced is not scriptural. And friend, that person is not somebody who is a candidate to marry. Why would you date someone then who you're not going to marry? And then if somebody's been married and divorced several times, you want to look at what might be the cause of that person being married and divorced several times. Do they, do they have an anger issue? Do they have some type of sin that keeps getting in the way of being a godly marriage? Do, are there problems that need to be addressed on the individual level before that person is ready to commit? And so you want to think clearly about this. As, as your soul and your relationship with God depends upon it, if you're dating somebody who is divorced and it's not for a scriptural reason, friend, we kindly say that that person, they're not a candidate to marry. Why would you date somebody who you're not going to marry if they do have a scriptural reason? And you would have a right to date that person, but still, just like in any other relationship, you want to make sure that's somebody who's putting God first. You want to make sure that that person's going to help you get to heaven, and you want to make sure that the kingdom and the church are coming first in every way. Now we move to a second question in our series today. An individual writes this question to us, what do we do when the law of the land says one thing and the law of God says something contradictory or totally different? Who should we obey? And so basically, if God's law says one thing and the law of the land says something different or opposite of what God's law says, who are we to obey? Well, friend, let's clearly understand that God's law commands us as best as possible to obey the laws of the land. Romans 13 verses 1 following says that if we don't obey the law of the land, we don't obey God. For God's, they've, they've been set in place, the governments have been set in place by God, and they are His ministers to set forth in His will in certain ways. And so obeying the law of the land as far as it's in line with the law of God, that's clearly something God wants us to do. But now, what about, what about when the laws of a certain country, let's just say the laws in the United States of America, what about when those laws are in violation or teach something different than what the laws of God teach? For example, Proverbs 6, verses 16 through 19, uh, we're not to harm, we're not to shed innocent blood. What about when the laws in the United States of America say that it is legal to kill unborn babies. The law of God says don't shed innocent blood. The law of the land says abortion is acceptable. There you've got two laws that are diametrically opposed. What should a Christian do when God's law and man's law are opposed to each other? Who should we obey? Well, let's turn our attention to the Scripture and notice what the Bible says in Acts chapter 5, verse number 29. That's Acts chapter 5. We learn the answer to this question in Acts chapter 5, verse number 29. Listen to the words of Peter in this verse. But Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. Now, what's going on in the context of Acts chapter 5? Well, you've got the law of God that's in place. Go into all the world and teach the gospel unto every creature. Mark 16, 15, Jesus said, go preach and teach the good news. There's the law of God. Now you've got a law that the Jewish leaders are imposing upon Peter and John. God's law said go preach. Now these Jewish leaders are going to say don't preach about Jesus anymore. And so you've got two competing laws. God said go preach. The leaders said don't preach, don't say another word about Jesus. What do we do when those two conflict? 
Acts 5 verse 29 tells us, we obey God rather than men. Peter goes on to say in Acts chapter 5, verse number 30, The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you murdered, by hanging on a tree. God has exalted Him. He goes on to say, we're going to preach about Jesus, whether you like it or not. And they go on to be beaten for that, but they count themselves worthy to suffer shame for the name of Christ. And so when we think about the fundamental question, as long as God's laws and man's laws are in harmony, then we obey both. If there comes a point in time where they are diametrically opposed to each other, God's law always trumps man's law. For example, as we mentioned earlier, if the law of the land says it's okay to kill babies and the law of God says it's a sin, and I say to the United States of America, I've got a higher judge and a higher government I must submit to. I submit to God before I submit to men. If the law of the United States of America says that it is, uh, it is legal for men to marry men and women to marry women and to be involved in homosexual relationships, and the law of God says, Romans 1 verses 26 through 29, that it's not, that that's not scriptural, that's not, that's not something that God authorizes, then friend, we obey God. We say from out of love and kindness that that's not according to the teaching of God and I cannot go along with and submit to that law. That law is contrary to the will of Almighty God. And so God's law must always trump man's law when the two are not in harmony and we ought to obey God rather than men. We now move to another question that has been submitted. And the question is asked in this way, why do some religious groups refer to their leader as father, others refer to them as reverend or pastor? Are those titles, titles that men or women should wear today? Well, friend, what a good question that is, and we hear it real regularly today. We hear people say, you know, father so-and-so, uh, down here did this, or, or, or the reverend, you know, somebody's name attached to it, or pastor so-and-so over at this community church, or something like under that. Are those titles that the Bible says men should wear today? Let's kind of address each of these uh, individually. The title Father, which is often associated with Catholic or Episcopal, sometimes uh, Methodist or something like under that, is that title a title that men should wear? Well, friend, the Bible says it absolutely is not. The Bible explicitly says men should not wear those titles. Now, why do we say that? Look in your own Bible in Matthew chapter 23, and I want you to look in verse number 9. Jesus clearly addressed this, and in the context, He's talking about religious titles. Teacher, uh, God, things like unto that. Uh, what about those titles? Jesus said in Matthew 23 verse 9, Do not call anyone on earth your father, for one is your father who is in heaven. King James says, Call no man father. And again, that's in the religious sense. I'm not going to address another man with the title of father as it relates to a religious title. That title is reserved only for God. And so is it right to call somebody father so-and-so in a religious sense? Jesus said, in that sense, call no man father. One is your father, spiritually speaking, God in heaven. Well, what about the title reverend? I often hear people refer to others as, this is our reverend, or reverend so-and-so gave a good lesson today. Well, what about that title? I want to address your attention or direct your attention to Psalm 111. Psalm 111 verse 9 teaches us who the title of reverend is actually to be given to. The Bible says in verse number 9 of Psalm 111, He has sent redemption to His people. He has commanded His covenant forever. Holy and reverend is His name. Who deserves the name or the title reverend? Somebody who's going through some theological school, somebody who's supposedly the preacher down somewhere. No, holy and reverend is God's name. Father, in the spiritual sense, is reserved for God. Reverend, 
which means uh, magnificent, awesome, holy, to be revered. That's a name that belongs to God in the Bible. And so the first two titles we sure don't find authority for uh, men to wear in the Scripture. Now, what about the title or the words pastor? There's a lot of confusion today on the office of a pastor, what a pastor is in the New Testament. We, we find many times today that a pastor is referred to as the preacher, or the one man down at some denominational group. Is that the way the Bible uses the word pastor? Friend, you will find the word pastor equated in the New Testament with the offices, with the office of elders in the New Testament. Now, let me share that with you. Look in your Bible in 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. That's 1 Peter chapter 5. Notice what Peter says about the office of an elder and how it is also that of the work of being a pastor. Peter says in 1 Peter 5, verse 1, The elders who are among you I exhort, I who am a fellow elder and a witness of the suffering of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that we will be revealed. Now watch this, shepherd, there's that word for pastor. Pastor or shepherd, the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers. Now, here you've got elder, you've got pastor, and you've got overseer. The words that are used to describe the office of overseers or bishops or elders in the New Testament. Acts 20 verse 28, Paul encouraged the elders in Ephesus to pastor, to shepherd the flock of God which is among you. And so when we think about the idea of a pastor, in the Bible there's never a one-man pastor system like you find today. There's always a plurality of elders. Acts chapter 14 verse 23, uh, Acts chapter 20 verse 28, 1 Peter 5, 1 and 2, I who am a fellow elder, implying that there are more as well, and then elders are often referred to as bishops or overseers, elders or older ones, or pastors or shepherds in the Bible. Those titles are used to describe the work and office of an elder, and so one man preacher system, pastor system is not what you find. There are pastors in the Bible, and in the New Testament, those are also called elders or overseers in the Scripture. And so while we find two of the titles definitively are used for God, the word pastor is used in the Bible for the office and work of an elder, a shepherd, or an overseer. Another question that we want to address today that has been submitted is such a good question today because it's a, a real problem that is being exposed uh, that a lot of people are having to deal with today. Here's the question. I've always struggled, someone says, or a viewer says, I've always struggled with pornography. Is pornography sinful? And if so, how do I overcome this in my life? Friends, studies are revealing that this has become an addiction for so many people today, and with the internet being so widespread, with having phones and tablets and computers and, and the host of digital media that is available today, pornography is becoming so much more of a problem. It used to be the case that it was available mainly in magazines that nobody really had or wanted to talk about, that were hard to get. But now, it's so readily available and so easy for especially kids to see today that it is a very real problem we have to deal with. And so let's address the first idea. Is pornography sinful? And friends, the Bible clearly teaches that the viewing of lustful, immoral, uh, ungodly images is indeed sinful. Jesus addressed it in Matthew chapter 5, verse number 28, and I want you to hear the words of the Lord in this context. Matthew chapter 5, listen to what Jesus said in verse number 28. Jesus said, But I say to you, whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. As it relates to sex and, and the relationship that God has created between a man and a woman, there is one authorized place for that to occur. Marriage is honorable. The bed, 
describing the sexual relation, the bed undefiled. But whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. The only place where uh, sex and the sexual relations is right and good and holy is inside the marriage relationship between one man and one woman. When you go to looking at images of other people, when you go to thinking thoughts about other people that is not inside that realm of marriage, then friend, as Jesus said in Matthew 5, 28, you've already, as it were, committed adultery in your heart. You began to lust over her in your mind. You began to think thoughts that are not right. You began to feel emotions that are not inside the sanctioned place and maybe even act upon those. Friend, that's definitely pornography is definitely contrary to the will of God. Now, let's address the second part of that question. How does one prevent or how does one overcome a pornography problem? Pornography is mainly a problem of the mind. And so to overcome the problem, one has to have self-control and control over what enters into his mind. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he, the Bible says in Proverbs 23, verse number 7. I've got to do my best to bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. And so, how do you overcome or prevent a pornography problem? Friend, you've got to start by controlling the mind, having self-control over what one thinks, what one views, what one listens to. Imagine it this way. Let's say that a person had a problem with cursing. And maybe for a big part of their life, they'd curse like a sailor all their life. How do you stop that? Well, you've got to realize it's a problem. You've got to realize it's wrong. And then you've got to work on it. You've got to remind yourself. You've got to say to yourself, when you say that word, you've got to say, that's not right. I can't say that anymore. You've got to be accountable. You've got to be cognizant of the fact that that's wrong. You've got to control what goes on in here and naturally comes out of your mouth. Well, the same is true when it relates to pornography. I've got to learn to control what I think about. I've got to think on things that are good and noble and right and, and, and just and holy. Philippians 4 verses 8 following, and then you've got to do this as well. And this is a big part of it. You've got to make sure that you're not in situations where it's going to be easily available for you to fall back into the problem. You know, if, I, if pornography problem is related to me and a computer, I need to have some way of making sure that doesn't come on that computer. I need to make myself accountable to somebody. Uh, I need to have some kind of, and there are good programs that will help watch this, some kind of program on there that will do that. Or I need to get rid of the computer. I need to get rid of the phone. I need to, you know, limit my access to the Internet or wherever it may be so that that temptation, until I'm a little stronger, until I have overcome that more, I need to make sure that that is not something that is readily available in my life. Now, especially to parents today. You want to make sure with the uh, availability of the internet and media today, you want to make sure to watch and to govern what goes on on all your media devices, whether it be TV, whether it be YouTube, whether it be the internet, whether it be a phone, whether it be a tablet. You want to make sure that you've got some way of controlling, watching, accessing, making sure that that's not becoming a problem and that, that, that that's not something that's going on, or at least if it is, you can do your best to prevent that as well. And so, friends, pornography is a big problem today, mainly because, me, even more so today, because it's so readily available. You can type a word in on the internet today and get thousands of images for free that a person would not naturally want to see. What are we going to do to prevent that? How do we work on it? It all starts right here. I want to think about what God wants me to think about. I want to make sure that my mind is holy and pure and right. I want to make myself accountable to others. I want to get rid of any type of device or media that may be a temptation until I am strong enough to overcome those problems and those urges. Now friend, as we thought today about Bible questions and answers, there's one question especially that we hope you're thinking about, and that is the greatest question of all. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Acts chapter 16, verse 30 and 31. Of all the questions that could be asked, there's no greater question than that one. Have you obeyed the gospel? Are you a child of God? Have you submitted to what the Lord teaches on the subject of salvation? 
Maybe you're saying to yourself, well, I don't know for sure. What does the Bible say I need to do to be saved? The Bible teaches you must first hear the Word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Romans chapter 10, verse 17. Before I, I believe, which is the next step in God's plan of salvation, I've got to have faith. I've got to hear the Word of God to have faith. Then once I've heard God's Word, I must believe in Jesus as the Son of God. Jesus Himself said, Unless you believe that I'm He, you'll surely die in your sins. John chapter 8, verse number 24. Having believed in Jesus, the Lord also teaches, one must repent. I must turn from sin and turn to God. Luke chapter 13, verse number 3, Jesus said, Unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. Peter preached in Acts 3 verse 19, Repent and be converted or turn again that your sins may be blotted out. Then one must also confess Jesus as the Messiah, as the Savior and the Son of God. Romans 10 verses 9 and 10, the Bible says, With the heart, with the mind, one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Like the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter 8, verses 36 through 39, we need to acknowledge, I believe with all my heart, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then, friend, Jesus clearly taught to be saved, to have one's sins forgiven. One must be baptized, immersed in water, for the remission of sins. Listen to how clear Jesus made it. Jesus said, He that believes and is baptized will be saved. He that does not believe shall be condemned. Jesus said you've got to believe and be baptized to be saved. Paul was told, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Acts chapter 22, verse number 16. Maybe you've never done those things. Friend, we encourage you to obey the gospel. If we can help you if you'd like to study more, if you'd like to have a copy of any of our lessons, please call us or write to us. And our hope and our main desire is ultimately that you'll obey the gospel and become a child of God. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the gospel through TV, radio, and internet. Our motto is to take the whole gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wife. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form, or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905, or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the Gospel of Christ.